Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. Today we're at 75 Webster Street in Worcester at a big studio building here in an old uh, factory building. And my guest is Brian Barris, and uh, he's a very energetic and prolific uh, painter, as well as a writer and poet. Uh, he has a few books out that are quite interesting. And uh, he's been showing quite a bit in the Worcester area. Many of you may be familiar with his work already. But we're delighted to be here and have a chance to share your work with our audience, Brian. Delighted thanks, to have thanks you. for having us. Uh, and uh, let's see, you're also on the board of Arts Worcester. I am. And uh, you're a, he's a full time fire lieutenant in the Worcester Fire Department as well, and a father of four, which is very impressive. That covers it. <laughs> your life must be pretty hectic. I don't know how you. Well, my kids are pretty self motivated. Yeah. They ask them to do something. And yeah. Oddly enough, they do it. So. Uh, well, there must be a reason for so that. So they're a big help. That's good. Yeah. So how um, how long have you been painting, and how many hours can you actually get into the studio? Uh, I've been painting since I was 16. So, geez, I didn't know I'd have to do math today. Uh huh. Uh, let's see. Rough numbers are good. Uh, 20 years, but there was a seven-year period where I wasn't painting. I was, uh huh. I was busy. I see. Things. So uh, there's a little hiatus there. And I just started up again in, I think, 2000, 2001. So. Well, you've put a lot of water under the bridge in those last 10 years. Wow. Yeah, I had some catching up to do, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And then when you come to the studio, you're mostly like doing it at night after yeah. work. Is that yeah. it? Yeah. When the kids are getting close to bedtime, the younger kids. I see. I, I can head out and. You know, I'm usually here for maybe four hours at a stretch, five hours. Well, that's good. I think if you can put four hours in, you can do quite a bit. A lot of that's waiting for the paint to dry, so. <laughs> so. Every, maybe you I don't like wait my, sometimes. My yeah, job. yeah, yeah. Get to watch paint dry. And the other reason uh, I wanted to tell you is uh, Brian recently closed a very interesting show called Broken at uh, the Aurora Gallery at Arts Worcester. And uh, that was quite a significant show, and uh, you had some, some good of, comments. Some of sure. these large pieces were in that show. Right, and all of them were large pieces. Yes, so and that was pretty much the intent of the show. And uh, were you preparing for that for quite a while, or was that uh, maybe eight months? Uh huh. So you know, because they're not time intensive, they're yeah. mostly layers. Yes. Uh, they, they go down quicker than people who yeah. tend to paint with brushes. You were saying before you do a painting a week? Yeah, yeah, if I'm lucky, you know. But I'm in here maybe three days a week. Too. Yeah. So. We'll have to talk about his process a little bit because I think that's uh, quite an interesting part of what you do. Um, I also uh, was very interested in the fact that you have so much... Um, sort of philosophy and psychology and I think what interested me uh, about you when I saw your show at the Aurora was uh, perhaps that I would consider you uh, what I would call a seeker, you know, and meaning somebody who is a lifelong learner and who is reading and sort of well, delving, <laughs> delving into uh, the big questions, you know, so. I so. think um, back in 2001, I had my first show at the Sprinkler Factory. Uh -huh. the, I, I think I was there. In the back section of I the remember well. that's where I met you, is in that well gallery. There remember? you go. So that was my first show. We were big with show. Jamie Johnson, and mm -hmm. I said, who's yeah. this guy? <laughs> and um, they had a private show afterwards. I guess it was some international students from Clark. They came, had a party cruise the artwork, whatever. I made myself available. And this young French woman had asked, well, what do they mean? And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because up until then, it was just, I paint and here are my paintings. So, I mean, I've, I've had enough film classes and enough lit to know yeah, how to read. you were saying you did design for uh, film. Uh, briefly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did film in college and, um, you know, English lit. Uh -huh. So I, I know how to, to pick out 
symbolism and semiotics yes. and meaning. Yeah. So I was like, all right, let me whip something up for you and, and uh, dissect the, the meaning of my own painting. So that's when I started saying, like, oh, there's psychological bifurcated color fields uh, representing the ego. And, and, you know, it was really just spinning it in retrospect. Yeah. And it just grew and grew. And well, I think it usually happens that way that you make the painting and then try to figure out what it means. You know, at least that to me is more I valid. I think the way I paint it does. Yeah, I think that's... a lot of the, the elements of the painting just come out during the process as opposed to pre-planning. And, and it's a much more spontaneous kind right. of thing. Right, so you look at it afterwards and go, oh. Yeah, yeah. And even during the process. Well, the can... whole thing for me is that somewhere in that process, you recognize something as being significant. Well, maybe we can look at this painting and, you know, get the idea of your process a little more clearly. Uh, yeah, that's a good example of the processes. Um, the orange you can see there is um, a really wet application. It's allowed to diffuse across the canvas. And then it's hit with enzymes that break it up, they diffuse it. That's how you get the spotting effect. And that make it break and pattern. And like I say, it's just a trick, you know. But it's nature. Well, it's I, it's, I like it's nature it. acting on matter. Yes. One of my favorite ideas that all form is created by energy acting on matter. And what you're doing is putting the energy into your material. So you're creating authentic form, you know. It works Authentic for me. pattern. You know what's kind of cool too, if you can notice the way certain areas where the paint is more brilliant or more uh, uh, chromatically intense, shall we say. But do you notice how much space that creates as you diminish the color or the, uh, let the value go cooler or darker? It really gives you this tremendous feeling, you know, that there's a 10 miles between this and this and this and this, so that you get this tremendous depth in this painting, don't you think? I'm glad it worked out that way, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it really does. You know, because after, it's really the application and um, the highlights are just hitting that, that orange or that terracotta color with the yellow and then yeah. fusing them yeah. together. And that's when you cross your fingers and hope, oh, I hope this comes out this way because this could dry a lot flatter. Yeah. And so you probably would go to a different layer. Well, this what, has many, many layers on it. What I really like, though, is the way the temperature of this is different from the temperature of that. Right. They're not all the same and orange. The, and yeah, that came from you knowing that a little more light or a little more yellow right. would make it advance even right. more. So. so it's a simple trick, but if you do it wrong, it But it takes a lot of <laughs> knowledge to make these sim simple tricks come off. I mean, the fact is, when Sargent put the brush on the page, it was a trick of the way he flicked his wrist yeah. and lifted the brush, but he knew how yeah. to do it because well, he knew how the shape was. The canvas, sure. Knew how the shape was. Yep. So, uh, so, so you could say this is more difficult because there's so much chance involved. And if you yeah. mix your paint wrong and get the viscosity yeah. wrong, it's not going to come out right. I have plenty of paintings. So, that don't come out so right. this has kind of a cosmological kind of uh, feeling, don't you think? Uh, yeah. Sure. Sort of like the... Uh, this is going to go on the Davis Show. And it's called The Soul. What is The Davis Show? What? Um, I believe it's going to be titled The Last Day on Earth. It's April 2012. And th this is at the Davis Gallery yeah. at, at Davis Publication? Yeah. Is that Assuming on they Front don't Street? see is the that paintings I'm preferring and say, wow, we don't want that. No. But I'm, I'm So you have hoping. a show coming up at the Davis. Show and and that is Davis. April of 12? 2012. Okay. And then the Fruitlands with Cindy Worley, Scott Arab, and Donna Dufo. No kidding. From Herb Photography. The three of us are doing a show together. And uh, that That's is... That's four. That's four of you. Well, they're, they're Herb Photography, Donna okay. Dufo and Scott. All right. They're, they're like one unit. So sure you have the herbs, Herb Photography, Cindy Worley, and Cindy you Worley. are doing a, three, a show at uh, Fruitlands Museum yeah. in... Uh, Harvard, Ayer. Is, is it? Ayer, Harvard. Harvard, the Mass. same area, yep. Oh, that's a beautiful place. Go and see that. When yeah, is that? Yeah, it was um, fall 2012. You were talking about the psychological as well as the metaphysical. You had background in uh, psychology, too, well, I understand. Well, for 10 years, I worked with dual-diagnosed uh, 
behaviorally challenged adults, so we had some pretty intensive training in behavioral modification. Behavioral modification. A, something of an armchair psychologist. You know, I read a lot. Uh-huh. You know, Jungian psychology. I'm a fan of uh, Hillman. Um, you know, Freudian Man stuff. Man and his symbol. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that was a good book. You know, Jung and archetypes and yes. Gnosticism. I yes. Mean, it pulls it all together. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, now this one, let's, let's talk about this giant one. That was in your Aurora show. That was in Broken. Yep. That's called Hanging Tree. And I wish I could credit the person who they, they had seen it and they tied it to a song, The Hanging Tree, about African Americans being hung down Well, that's, uh, what's her name? Uh, Come on, you can do it. Uh, it'll come she to me when I try not to think of it. Song. I can hear her voice singing. Yes. It. Yeah. See, I'm terrible with little yeah. details like that. Um, so he tied that to that. Um, it's strange I go fruit. Further back strange to fruit. The strange fruit. Yeah. And if you go on YouTube, you'll find a video that is just one image after the other of African Americans being hung, and it's, it's yeah. You know, it's one of those. So it was the buried, lynchings, the lynchings, yeah. and so forth. For me, it goes back further. I, I tend towards the more classical themes, so it would be Judas being hung. And well, the obvious, you know, it could be all of the above, but the obvious, the obvious <laughs> image, just like the archetype in this one of the light at the end of the tunnel, this tree defying the elements and being isolated and lo alone on the horizon, you know, is also kind of archetypal. But uh, like you said, uh, all of these I, I can't help but think of these as landscapes yes. because of the cars on Well, this car is, is a landscape. Yeah, yeah. And I think the first time someone said, oh, you're, you're a landscape painter. I think it was after the 20 Artist Show at the Davis Gallery when Scott Herb did the book. Um, somebody had said, oh, yeah, and these landscape painters, you should look at them. And it was Cynthia Worley and myself. And, um, so did you look at Whistler and people like that? No, Not Whistler, I was like, I'm oh, sorry. Um, I'm a landscape painter? Turner, Turner. You should I look. like Turner paintings. Yeah. Um, but again, recognizing that, that people were seeing landscapes as yes. opposed to just bifurcated yes. color fields or empty landscapes, yes. kind of freed me up to do landscapes. So yes, so, you know, so gives I'm, you a whole new direction. It. Yeah. One of the revealing one of the revealing things that happened to me because I used to paint really wet with acrylic, and I would keep the painting flat, probably like you do, because wow. otherwise it would drip. I cheat now. Sometimes you drip. Yeah. Oh, I love to drip. Yeah. I'm sure. But we can I find would put the everywhere. painting flat. But one of the things that really struck me all of a sudden one day as a revelation was that the difference between looking down. Mm -hmm. At, and, and or it looking on the across. <laughs> That's why I painted and on the table. So if it were water or sky, you know, looking up could be landscape, but there's no, it's a different perspective. Sure. So we were so conditioned by that looking across the land to that uh, horizon line. But this could also be landscape, or this sure. could be landscape, you know, flat That's down. That's why I write on the back of my paintings, which is the top and which is the bottom. Because sure. Oh, I've, I've had that experience <laughs> where you say, is this a night scene, and the dark is at the top and the white is at the bottom? Or you turn it the other way and say, or is this a snow scene? See, I try not to snow get scene. into that. It's, <laughs> well, it's too easy sometimes to turn it and go, oh, that looks better that way. Yeah. Well, but you just go with what you choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think as as I've painted more, the yeah. paintings come out more like I yes. intended them, so I don't yes. have to turn them on their side to see things. Well, I think what works in your painting and what makes the painting uh, engaging for me, other than these things we're talking about, is I'm just talking about visually, is this very subtle texture and color and pattern. So for me, they're very much about that. And I was saying before, it's interesting because you really don't have a lot of shape in your paintings. Well, the texture is... Yeah. Uh, it's a so you have thing. to carry it on the texture and... Well, there's an illusion of texture. There's an illusion yeah. of texture. You just like with watercolor. It's just so. Uh, my brother-in-law, he paints uh, portraits. He went to RISD and uh, he used to paw my paintings. He'd be like, oh, it just bugs me that there's no texture. 
Um, yeah, it's these live smooth ones, they're yeah. a lesser texture than these. Yes. But if you touch that red now one, you're starting you to use some kind of gels and gesso. Well, just a gesso, just but gesso. I lay that down as you a, don't use a thickener like a gel of nope, some kind or just a sandiness. Big, heavy layer or? of gesso, and then I basically torture it to get it to come up with texture. Let it dry. You bring it to life. It. You bring it to life. And the texture under it. It does wonders for the paint. And then, of course, when you pull the color on top of the texture, it it kind of uh, lies in all the little grooves and depressions, and the white parts come up, and so it really becomes very physical. Yes. Very physical. Well, anyway, <laughs> I I really enjoy uh, the ones you're doing. You know that are like landscapes. I'll pull that starry night one over here. I'm, I'm oh, sure you're going to. Oh, this is an older one. It's very interesting, though. Now, this looks like a different process. You know, we were saying about the process as being random. Well, go ahead and run your hand over it. Pardon? Go ahead and run your hand right over it. Smooth, you feel as, any smooth, smooth as glass. Oh, we got to move in. Okay. So, it's really just laying down a layer of paint. I think at this point I was actually using a roller to do it quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it was a simple diffusion. Mm -hmm. so this is one of those paintings where mm -hmm. the result was so you dropped something hours. which would repel the water, yes. the, repel the paint, yes. like droplets, you know, probably splattering in yep. a rough way. But but well, just depends, you know, too. here's the thing that's kind of cool about it though: all the spots could be the same size, but they're not. The fact that these are teeny tiny ones again, it kind of adds to the feeling of a plane rather than the vertical plane, right. or you know, it, it changes There's meaning. There's actually like a half dozen different ways to achieve this. Sure. So like these sure. larger spots, you're putting. I know I did these with enzymes. The smaller spots were probably water spots on half-dried paint that I took up mm -hmm. with the whatever yeah. a paper towel or whatnot. So it's yeah. going to give you a more focused. So if you're doing more sharp you're layering contrast. that effect yeah. sure. rather than making it, you know, absolutely one dimensional. Well, you know, that okay. goes this goes back to the thing of looking down at the water too, you know, as a as a landscape or but there's also that beginning of the uh, horizon taking shape. Yeah, I I'm like big on the little painting. I like the little horizontal threads make it look like the was, surface of water. That was from the roller. Roller? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. I, I don't often use any kind yeah. of tools. Now it's mostly my hands. Uh, That's why I have paint yeah. on my fingernails most of the time. You know, we were talking before about the, the idea of chance and how that can create composition or content or whatever. And, um, you know, whether there are ways, I was saying your process seems very intuitive. Is that fair to say? or? Yeah, I think it developed that way. You know, uh -huh. just from not being formally schooled. So I like that about yes. being a primitive or a self-taught painter is, you know, you get to know the pain on your own level. Yes. Uh, and as far as composition and everything else. Yes. I mean, obviously I've been exposed to paintings, but I'm um, not overly influenced by having learned, you know, eight different styles of painters and bringing mm -hmm. them up and referencing them mm -hmm. in my works later on. Mm -hmm. You know, this just allows me to do whatever the heck I want. Yeah. That's what I like about Worcester. But the beautiful, <laughs> me too, yeah. me too. The Worcester I've seen something, allows me to do whatever I want. There's something good here, something yeah. good happening here. The thing is though, when you work spontaneously like that, when you work intuitively, I think there comes a moment when you have a little aha and you perhaps say, I really like that. Right. Or I recognize that as right. being something significant. I think you go through a period where you're you're getting those spontaneous moments and you go, Oh, that's cool. I love that. But the rest I of your love that isn't there. Yeah. So the trick is to be able to, to bring the to bring the whole thing together. Because yes. I don't keep a canvas that I can't show. Yeah. So I can't keep a canvas because one piece of it came out really cool and the no. rest of it. That's one of the hardest so, things is when you get some little miracle happening on one little part of the yeah. painting, but it doesn't now work. Now there's actually in the, something yeah, at stake. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the trick is to learn how and to you make also, your whole painting come you together. You also have to be way. willing to destroy that yes, if need be. absolutely. If need be. And something yeah. better might happen. Yep. Something better might happen. So, and I collaborate at times, too. So try to not between two people. 
at all. Well, where the, one person the, may or may not obliterate something where you were taking it. So it's a, it's a huge trust factor and you really got to be working on the same level and yet know at the same time that you're not violating the other one's space by painting over or altering or, you know, hitting it with oh, a process. Oh, go ahead, process. paint over it. Well, that's just it. <laughs> You know, so you well, what someone... I think about collaborating with somebody else who's going to, they're going to have, often? I've, no, <laughs> uh, I, I'm too much of a do it my way or the highway. But what hap the good thing about it is that it forces you, it throws you off your game. It yeah. forces you off your right. comfort area and it makes you start from a different place. You know, one of the nice things about your process is look at the beautiful edges he gets. You know, if he were just painting in that black shape. It's because I can't paint, so I have the to diffuse shape, the edges. <laughs> the shape would be flat and boring. It implies more is there. Because the edge would be, you know, flattening on the surface. That was in the WPI show. Yeah. Um, they opened up a, a gallery in their Salisbury Hall. And because college students are college students, Somebody hit it with a dry erase pen. They just scribbled on it. Really? And so I took it back to the studio and wiped the dry erase pen off. And, and found out you had a new thing. It really worked out well. You know what they say. <laughs> you so get a good throw painting a when you have problems. To whoever vandalized When that you pen. have problems that you have to solve, something new will come. Yeah. And that's wow. more representational. That's also slated for the Davis Show. Uh-huh. And uh, this is almost figurative to me. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's meant to be? Um, yeah. Yeah. It is meant to be. <laughs> it could also be landscape, though. But again, it's, it's meant to be vague enough that you could see whatever you want to see in it. Yeah. But it's definitely darker. Yeah. It has a more organic, um, you know, almost skeletal sense to it. Yes. So it, it carries that like sort of emotion. It feels like a skeleton yeah. springing up to And me. there's a whole, um, actually there's cold water in there. Go for the fridge. Um, yeah, so the show for Davis, um, it, it definitely has a narrative to it. And uh, the narrative gets what dark was the title and again? comes back out. Uh, Last Day on Earth. Okay, so it's going to be uh, more dark imagery or something um, uh, not necessarily. Alternating, really. You okay, know? Um, I'll be waiting to see. Yeah. When is that again? April? April 2012, unless something changes Davis in between Davis Publication, now and that's on yep. Front Street. And yeah. Keep your eye open. Or you can also check Brian's website. He's got that's a terrific true. website. What's your website? BurrisWorks.com. B U R R I S Works, all one word, yes. dot com. Yep. He's got a terrific website, and you can read a lot about his ideas and his uh, uh, what goes into the, you know, the thought behind the work, and it's quite interesting. I spent a couple hours reading it last Good. night. <laughs> Great. But this one really strikes me like um, almost like the incredible lightness of being, whatever that you know. <laughs> It, it has this... Actually, the film, The Incredible Lightness of Being, has nothing that about, to do uh, with... Uh, <laughs> no. It's just I like that phrase. Well, this is called Three Days. Three Days. And uh, apparently my religious upbring upbringing creeps into my painting themes. Yeah. Um, apparent, well, but don't according you think, to some people. Don't you think this light <laughs> is just like it would like surround you and mm -hmm. lift you? If that's what I meant yep. by the incredible lightness of being. I don't I'll tell you the truth. I don't even remember the movie, but but this just has the feeling of like some irate, you know, yeah, some illumination radiance. or yep. something. Some radiance. That's the word. Radiance. Yeah. Um, you know, we haven't talked much about your uh, writing, oh. and uh, we'll grab one of those books and we'll hold one up at least. But uh, Brian has been doing several books that are, uh, he's quite, quite, has an interesting way with words. Uh, I was, There's I'm not always one. sure I know what you're talking about, Brian. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but I loved your work. That's the, po that's what I realized. <laughs> that it's more, it's more like a stream of consciousness thing. It's Where you get a, a little vignette of this or a little yeah. vignette of that. But that's why I like the titles 
that you use on your works because those are like little snippets of poem. Right. Don't you think so? They they give you some I think Julie access. Julie Grady said that as well. She did. The they give you access book. to the work in a very uh, poetic way. It's not factual. They title. supplement. They yes. supplement the painting, and they sometimes they help yes. steer you as towards what the the meaning yes. of it. Yes. But what I like about it when I say they're po very poetic is they're not giving you a factual title that says you know tree yeah. with rock. <laughs> It's, uh, it's a title that reads between the lines. You know, it, it kind of gives you some kind of access be, that's not the facts, but that's right. more the, the it's more sense more motive of it. than, yes, exactly. you know, seeking to draw a picture. So these books that you've put out, this one called Broken from your Aurora show, and then you're using pieces of uh, writing in conjunction with the with the imagery, yes. So uh, whether it's my own writing or quotes from yeah, a lot of it is your own writing though. A isn't lot it? of it's my own writing. Yeah. Now, do you write independent of the paintings, or is that something that always goes hand in hand with um, the paintings? I find a lot of it is conversations with other artists about particular paintings or about painting in general. So um, you know, it just naturally lends itself to throwing it in another way of sorting it out it's a way of developing uh, and clearing <laughs> your mind and and well, understanding it's, it's definitely a meditative exercise yeah um, but I do like the kid that yes this is my art therapy and then when I get my stereo turned up down at home then that's my music therapy time and we have two cats and a dog so I got pet therapy one of the best <laughs> things about art is that it takes you beyond yourself you know into another well, realm it, it gets me certainly out of my everyday world Yes. You know, I come here and I paint, and the focus is painting. Yes. With the music in the background, of course. And also the idea that you're discovering something that's a truth that's going to have significance for you in your yeah. life. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are just about out of time, so uh, I'm going to have to. Uh, Boy, time flies. I'm going to have to uh, say goodbye for now, but thanks Pleasure. a million. I really enjoyed thanks talking about your work. And I hope you're all going to look for Brian's work around town uh, coming up at the Davis and, uh, and then next April. So thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again in the future for another edition of Arts and Ideas.